so no, no so far we have been dealing with i mean we have been listening to experts from multiple domains specific to something specific to their organization their technology and things like that now we will try to bring in the perspectives of different stakeholders in this panel uh, no uh, uh, specific to the theme of today's uh, con no conference augmenting skills but specific to the future technologies now we spoke about robotic process automation with sunil we spoke about aws and things like that so all these technologies are changing and many new technologies have come and it is expected to change in a very very rapid pace so now uh, we are happy that we have a mix of people i think i don't i need not introduce all of you again because we had a good introduction in the uh, video so we have a large employer like tcs we have strong technology companies we have you know design uh, no side of uh, company we have a uh, Uh, HR had turned CEO, Mr. Rajan Sethuram, and we have a mix. No, we have a global guy, Mr. Saurab. No, he he lives in uh, uh, California, so it's a, it's a very very good mix. So we will be start. No, I'll I'll start this panel with uh, each one of you setting the tone for this panel for five minutes each on what is your perspective on augmenting skills for future technologies. How do we augment skills for future technologies? What according to you will change the way in which we are doing things today, and your your initial perspectives. So we will start with. Uh, so thank you thank you for inviting me over um sitting in context of the future um uh, i think we should step back a bit and see what we've achieved in the last 10 years uh, across the globe uh, there's been a mobile revolution that all of us are aware of uh, we understand that just about every business around the world whether it's healthcare uh, whether it is your uh, automobile industry whether it's garment whether it is uh, banking retail there's been a pervasive engagement where with the mobile revolution the consumers come to the forefront for every business right it in the past reaching out any business you know with, with a solution or a product they've always gone with what their perspective was but what has happened in the last 10 years uh, due to the pervasive uh, you know uh, engagement of mobile because of your Uh, 4G technology coming in at 5G in the annual. Consumers have become the kings of you know sharing their perspective, and and this has led to a lot of intelligent data for businesses residing across the globe in the form of unstructured data. There are opinions that we give with the brands that we engage in in our social media forums, and I have an opinion about a business and an, an experience that I've had. um and i share that in social media and so does the billions of people and this all led to a humongous amount of unstructured data that is lying there that's one side of the new spectrum and that's what we're facing in the future how to process this data how to understand meaningful insights from the data that will contribute back to businesses right from the research and development to innovation to go to market to financial departments to hr because there's a lot of employee opinion that also lie Uh, in social media so companies and enterprises would like to know what the employees think about them so all this has led to a great deal of unstructured data lying there okay and that's the first opportunity in the future uh, that i would like to you know call out uh, for for institutions and students alike to go and explore i'll come back to that in a bit to say how this this can be done next is the legacy internal system data i mean if you need to take a bank for example it's a very easy example because all of us engage with banks Can you think about the number of data that they would have, even with their own domain, right? There is casa accounts, right? There is savings account, rent account data. In loans, they have car loans, you know, home loans and auto loans and every form of loan. And then there's different types of credit card data. There is different types of insurance data that banks have extended themselves into. Typically, a large enterprise bank would have about 40 to 100 data sources within their own enterprise. So we talk, and that's called the structured data. data is with, within them how do we massage or you know marry this unstructured data that is lying in the external world bring context to the internal data so that i would be able to engage with my business with my customers effectively is the first challenge and most organizations worldwide there's a recent idc analysis that was uh, that was uh, you know published worldwide only one third of enterprises make best use of this structured and unstructured data okay and billions of dollars are actually lost in breach of this data okay there's a security issue right and third there is very little organizations who have made an investment in the past but in the last 4 years about 60 billion dollars have gone into processing this data 
so that that can make you know sense to enterprises. And all of this is the first level of opportunity. How do we process this data, which needs to be scalable, which needs to be secure, and most importantly, be relevant to businesses? And all of this cannot be done with the way we used to do business before, hence the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning to process this data. And that's where your first opportunity is, right? And, and this can be done only by an autonomous database, right? An autonomous database means you may think, you know, database management may, may lose jobs. Maybe the jobs are getting redefined. Database management is no more because autonomous data can manage itself. Uh, it, can, it can go and correct itself. It can go and apply itself. It can scale itself. So database administration would become a more intelligent job of driving this through analytics and artificial intelligence. Now, this is at the DB level. Now come next layer of opportunities that, that would come from a perspective of the future is, how do I make this data relevant to my financial department, right? How, how can ERP systems become more intelligent to provide insight to the financial department and the CFO so there are more business insights that can come in? How can I engage with my customers in sales and marketing, leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning so that my prospecting of customers and engaging with customers becomes more holistic than to go and talk to them about what I have to give and more to understand their perspective and be able to serve them more effectively. I mentioned a little while earlier about HR applications. How can I engage with my employees using intelligent insights from businesses and likewise with every business vertical. So, so the end-to-end -end spectrum is about every business area uh, the augmentation needs to be done with artificial intelligence and machine learning, whether it is at the database level or at the business applications level across the spectrum of the world. Great. I think it sets the tone. I'll come back to you. So naturally, I'll move to Mr. Rajan Setraman. I'll come back to you. Because, you uh, know, when he talks more about uh, data analytics, he's the right person who should take the cue next. Mr. Rajan, your perspective on it? It's on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And... Uh, Actually, Bharat has uh, done a pretty good job of covering the spectrum of the possibilities in data and analytics. Uh, I will uh, maybe bring out uh, some of the philosophical aspects of it, right? One is that uh, analytics and data uh, might seem new, but uh, it's been around for, uh, for ages, ever since the dawn of uh, life and biology, in the sense that uh, we, can, we can all, uh, uh, if you go back to our biology books, we know that at the end of the day, I mean, uh, uh, life itself is information, right? And information processing is what results in the evolution of life. If you get down to the core of uh, uh, DNA as an, in, as an information processing molecule. Uh, what is possible now though is that we can actually look into all of this data using some very powerful tools and technologies and uh, that allows us to really become intimate and familiar not only with a class as a whole, but also the unique differences that make up an individual within that class. Uh, let me elaborate. What, what I mean by that is that uh, today is the age of uh, hyper-personalization. Everybody would have heard about it. So as consumers, we all want to get the exact product and services that we are interested in. As patients, we want to get healthcare which is finely tuned to what is happening in my body, my uh, predisposition for illnesses, health and so on. As an employee, I want to get very unique opportunities, you know, be it uh, learning or on the job or career progression, which is tailored to my interest and my passion. So all of us are craving personalization, but at the same time, we also want to be recognized as belonging to a class, to a community, to a group of people because that's what helps you be human, right? The, the, the interconnectedness is what brings out that, that, that aspect in us. So much of the opportunities that will emerge in the coming years will be about how do you understand this belongingness to the class, but at the same time you are able to also dive really deep into the hyper-personalization aspects. So everybody is interested in getting that kind of hyper-personalization hyper product or service and uh, it'll be, uh, there'll be phenomenal opportunities that'll be available, right, in that space. So a lot of the data and analytics that we talk about that, that my company does, for example, is really a deep dive into that. How can I understand each individual in their diversity and individuality and then come up with the right kind of uh, 
products, services, offerings that we can put in front of them. Now, whatever be that industry might be, whatever be that company might be. This calls for uh, a great deal of uh, problem solving skills. I know that we'll talk about skills a little later, but uh, uh, data is there, it's plentiful. Bharat talked about unstructured data, structured data that is available within the organization. What is needed though is to come up with the right kind of use cases and contextual situations that will help us take all of the data, put it together, and come up with those hyper-personalized products, services, and offerings. I think that is where the opportunity lies ahead. And therefore, much of the skilling, the reskilling, and the learning that will be necessary for students, for institutions to focus on will be around how can we make use of all of that stuff? And how can we come up with the right kind of product and offerings? Yeah, I think that, that, that was my second question. So let me get uh, perspective from Saurabh on uh, no, uh, what is the global perspective on this? Because you are the one who is representing global. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thambi, uh, for having me here. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sivakumar. We haven't met yet. We'll meet. Uh, I think uh, we need to look back here, like, we're talking about augmenting skills. Uh, and we understand, like, and we always would focus on when we say that, you know, uh, we need to acquire skills, we always think of a workforce which is young, fresh, fresh blood and you know people who are out of college and young grads what we don't understand or maybe you know a lot of people would not really focus on this is that the current workforce is also part of the future workforce so when we talk about augmenting skills it has to be augmenting skills for everyone of course the fresh blood who are already part of the workforce and everyone who will be inducted in the workforce when i say that and why i'm saying this is because i see a lot of people from university here i see a lot of faculty here and which is very important, in fact, somebody today raised an issue that why don't we have a campus to cooperate but for faculty, wherein all our faculty could also be part of, you know, a lot of programs, you know, uh, work with companies, uh, collaborate with them. There could be an industry academy, a collaboration, but for faculty. But I think that's a very interesting perspective. And I'm sure a lot of universities are already doing uh, something in that area. But the more and more we pursue that, I think you know we'll have greater outcomes because at the end of the day, you are the people who are actually impacting those young minds. In the classroom, it's what you do. You are kind of their role models. They look up to you. So in fact, when a kid, or let's say a, a college grad, when he would, let's say YouTube today we know is like the go to university for a lot of people. So maybe you can guide them that what are the correct platforms and which means that everybody is, has to be part of that ecosystem. The mindset has to change. Wherein everybody collaborates on the same skill sets. And then we talk about, yes, now we are talking about augmenting the skills. Also, one, one most important thing is, when people say that acquiring skills, and we all focus on acquiring skills, it's so important to acquire skills. I think acquiring a skill, the skill is not relevant. It doesn't matter whether what skill you're acquiring, whether it is artificial intelligence, quantum computing, or data analytics, or social media management, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the art of acquiring that skill. The art of learning, the art of curiosity is more important than any other skill. It really doesn't matter. Think about this. 10 years ago, all the skills that we're talking about, in fact, today a lot of companies here would go and hire app developers. Six years ago, there was nothing called as an app developer. It only came into existence with Apple and then of course there's a complete Google ecosystem. So the point is, all those people who realized, and of course faculty and everybody also played a great role in that, and of course there was a self-drive with people, with students themselves, and it's not just students, even working professionals, they also understand that we may not be maybe irrelevant in the future. So they keep working on this, this hunger, this art of curiosity is the most important thing. I think that's the most important skill ever which will take you and which will always keep you relevant in whichever scenario you are in. Whether it was like 1000 years ago, 100 years ago, or even 1000 years from now. Of course, a lot of things would change. I'm not really here to predict what might happen in the future. But of course, this is an innate quality of human beings, which, will, which is definitely valuable. And of course, we, we look at the future workforce, so we completely understand that there are a lot of things which are changing. Uh, in fact, I also want to talk about what's really important uh, with young kids especially, of course, the art to communicate is very important. The art of collaboration is very important. 
Now think about this. This is what we do in, in universities and colleges. Uh, the assessments framework has to change completely. You know, what we have been doing is, we have been assessing the intellect of candidates, always. In fact, we have been through exam, I'm, I'm sure everybody has here has been through a lot of competitive exams and a lot of pressure of giving an ITJ and all of that, or whatever examination that we have given. All these examinations, wherever in the world, it's very unfortunate. They have only been assessing your memory, what you can cram. Think about this. What happens with a, with a class one student or in class five, K-12, pick, pick anywhere. I'm not talk, talking about just India, pick in US as well, anywhere. Essentially, and it's changing though, essentially we have been focusing on what you have crammed, what you have marked. And this is what you've been doing. In fact, when we were also in uh, our engineering uh, at IIT also, we will not study the whole semester. And there are some futile courses. That's, that's the irony. There are a lot of futile courses an engineering curriculum which doesn't make sense at all. Now think about this, what is the point? I was, I was from a stream which was metallurgical and material science. I ended up working as a software developer. What's the point of studying material engineering? What's the point of a lot of people studying mechanical engineering, civil engineering, when at the end of the day, they'll be working in a software giant. Very unfortunate. The R&D system has not been built like that. So there are a lot of things, I mean like, let's not diverge. But the point is, the art, of learning is important, out of curiosity is important, and also uh, in a future workforce, you need to understand that it's gonna be an era of meritocracy. Now think about this, what is happening. All the best guys, in fact in companies, people with 10 years, 20 years experience, today are quitting their job, and they are becoming a brand themselves. They become consultants, and they have joined the gig economy. In fact, I know a lot of people, they call themselves as gig stars, which means, they understand that, okay, fine, I want to work with this domain, this is my passion, but then of course working with an organization, just one organization, limits my bandwidth and my ambit of doing creative endeavors. So which is what we also need to understand and tell our kids that I think what is more important is you understand the art of acquiring the skill, make yourself a brand, be vigilant about what's happening around, I mean like, and that's where faculty can really play a great role. Tell them what's happening, what are the trends, keep them updated. This is what is working and, you know, in fact, this is also one of the most, most important thing is, help them understand and, you know, appreciate design. Help them understand, you know, be more confident when they speak to others. These are very, these are, these are intangible skills, but trust me, these are the most valuable skills. Yes. Don't really care about any technology skill, anything that is happening right now. I trust me, it will go down. Yes, sir. No, you, you, you know, you made two points. One is, you know, make them think design. Other one is make them create, you know, think, uh, you no know, creatively. I yes. think let's let's lead this to, yes, sure, sure. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Dipangar Bhattacharya because he's the one person who is in this panel who always uh, breathes design. So, Dipangar, your perspectives, initial five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Anbu. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so, I will uh, set some context before getting into why augmenting skills is important on future technologies. Uh, in fact, in, if we really look at, you know, we did some analysis as a company, as a technology leader in design and uh, manufacturing, technologies for design and manufacturing. You know, uh, if you look at the world population, the way it is growing, we are supposed to be at about, you know, 10 billion by 2050. The growing middle class population I, and also the number of people that will be living in cities by 2050. You know, I expected about 68% of the population will live in cities by 2050. So with, so all these numbers and figures does have some implications. Like, you know, it leads to, you know, say more transportation, you know, it leads to more food, abundant housing, and so on and so forth, okay? So I think if we continue to do the things the way we are doing today, we will not be able to meet the growing demands of the growing population, okay? And that is where the role of a technology leader like Autodex becomes of critical importance. The role of the technologies that we offer becomes very, very critical. So that's what I wanted to set the context as to why it is important to you know, uh, augment skills in future technologies. The next point which I wanted to highlight is if you look at skills today, I would look at three dimensions, the way skills should be taught. 
uh, in an in an education ecosystem because they are nurturing the talent for the future for for the industry so if you look at it you know there are three dimensions that i will look at uh, in fact the first dimension is what we call the mindset which seldom change okay this is the core because this is what we call conceptual content okay or con conceptual learning uh, just let me just give you an example you know when we talk about conceptual learning we can talk about things like from a technology perspective things like generative design or we can talk about building information modeling so this is where we are talking about learning a concept using tools the next aspect is what we call the skill set now skill set is more of inter industry and disciplinary content which is basically you know uh, the way you design a project like it is like for example you know there are a lot of education institutions who may be present here who look at uh, you know uh, who students look at participating in design competitions like SAE and mini Baha and so on and so forth so if we can really embed him with the right kind of content uh, for that particular project and that is what I mean by saying disciplinary and industry content and the last level which is very tactical is the tool set is what we offer whether a technology company or any other technology company can offer is a tool set which is more of the you know the technical content of how to use the tool so in an education institution I think augmenting skills should be across these three dimensions and from a technology standpoint we as a technology company are looking at nurturing the talent for future technologies now if you look at why future technologies if you look at two decades back we were in an era of documentation then we have we came to an era of optimization and now we are in the era of connections now why this is important because the job roles are changing so the talent that comes out of the in, of, of the education institution must be in, in par with the latest industry trends or the future industry trends and that's where a technology giant like Autodesk today talking about technologies like generative design which is the need of the hour which is changing the way that you know designers are going to design is no more a passive design it's more of the designer giving some constraints and you know giving and, and you know getting different iterative options and then choosing the best design so it is going to change the way designers and industry is going to work moving further then we look at things like this digital manufacturing I think design is not complete till it is manufactured so the entire cycle of design validate simulate uh, and manufacture is where we can nurture the talent with the skill sets and the technologies that Autodesk we as a technology leader can offer and I will leave it at this at this point of time and um, maybe I'll come back on this yeah, later. Yes, yes. That will be good. See, now you spoke more uh, related to innovation. I think I'll move on to VMware then finally come to TCS because TCS is the one company which people would like to hear because end of the day, no, they are the one who is supposed to take uh, the people whomever we train with all your inputs. So first let me hear from uh, uh, you know, the director of VMware, uh, Mr. Arun, your perspectives. Hello everyone, um, so being a core uh, software engineer myself, I just wanted to talk more on the software skills which are very relevant uh, today in my view. So what is VMware's vision? So VMware's vision is any device, any application, any platform. Any device, any application, any platform. So it has rewind back uh, 20 years back and so on. If you want to do anything, you have to go to an office. A desktop is the only way by which uh, you could do all your day-to-day -day work and things have changed now right so when I say any device it's not just your desktop it's your laptop it is your mobile phone it's your note and even your Apple watch right and again applications uh, runs across different domains it can run on-premise it can run uh, on a public cloud or it could run on uh, what we call as a SaaS service and similarly, the platform can be on-prem or a public cloud or a private cloud or a uh, hybrid cloud. So VMware's vision is to help in this entire uh, digital transformation by being an enabler to make this a reality, any device, any application, any platform. So uh, given this uh, context, I 
thought of sharing few uh, software skills which are very relevant today. As some of the speakers spoke before, yeah, some of the skills are relevant today and of course in five years or 10 years, it may not be relevant. But let me share what I feel as uh, skills which are important as on today. It's basically a cloud era, right? So we have uh, everything, all lot of uh, companies moving towards cloud. So having a good knowledge of the public cloud uh, services like AWS, uh, GCP and Azure is very important. And the other important concept which is new in the technology space is containers. Like how a VM virtual machines was uh, very popular or made popularized maybe 15 years back, 10 years back. Now uh, containers are getting very popular, right? So containers are lightweight. And uh, I would strongly encourage that Kubernetes, which is basically a cloud orchestration uh, platform and Docker, which is basically a, a platform which provides a way to distribute and build these containers. Right? So these, I definitely, this in the next five years, I think containers will be the de facto which will be used in application development. Uh, next is, uh, there is a lot of requirement for web developers, for people who do all these web applications. And a lot of skills around, even I saw a stall outside uh, about full stack engineer, right? So the full stack engineer requirement will be more relevant in the coming years, which means learning a lot of the front end technologies, back end, and of course, a lot of databases. And it's no longer just the MySQL database. We have a lot, lot of more database varieties which we have, all catering to different use cases, which analytics and so on. There are a lot of databases to learn like MongoDB, Cassandra, Kickhouse and so on. And next, uh, if you cl closely watch on a lot of the job postings and so on, right? Like uh, the concept of manual testing is getting defunct, right? It's all automation driven testing, right? So if anyone doesn't know automation skills or it doesn't equip with automation skills, uh, it is going to be very difficult for them to survive in the industry. So, Knowing automation, augmenting yourself with automation skills, with whatever tools available, whatever automation infrastructure available uh, would be very essential. And the last one which I want to stress upon is, um, we have um, DevOps CICD, right? So with, uh, before we have long release cycles, now with this agile development model, we have a lot of, a lot of shorter re uh, release cycles where we want to quickly develop and deploy products. So this DevOps CICD is very much relevant today and uh, it's better if the students can equip all these skills like things like Jenkins, Jet, Bamboo, Ansible and so on, uh, which would really help them when they come and face the industry. Right? So I felt these technical skills are very relevant today and if the academia can really train the students around this, it will of course help them to face the industry when they come and uh, join us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arun. I think, uh, I think all of them have uh, set different perspectives uh, because they, they are from different companies. I think no, uh, now we will hear from Naveen. What is it you look at it? No, because uh, you are the one you know, who almost hire uh, half of the Indian uh, young graduates. I think you should tell us, should we learn whatever they said or what is that? No, I mean, should we teach the students everything? What is your perspective? Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I Before I start discussing about this, uh, there are two things which is very difficult in life, okay? At least, especially when we participate in such forums. Uh, one, immediately speaking after lunch. Number two, <coughs> speaking as a last member in the panel discussion. Yeah, that to the six member panel, uh, speaking as a six is quite difficult because already some of or most of them would have taken all the points and spoken all the points. Having said that, okay, more from a human resources point of view, uh, from an employer point of view, I will more touch base on the software. When I say the software, uh, I'm not talking about the software which carries all the technologies. I am talking about the software which is a human resource. What is the expectation? or what they need to be prepared with before they come into the industry or how they have to be preparing themselves or how the academic can prepare themselves before they come into the industry. 
uh, before that maybe i need to certain things might be overlapping but i need to give that context as well uh, one very important thing the world today is changing okay when i say this it's not a generic statement from a consumer point of view it is changing uh, from an organization point of view things are changing from an education point of view from an emotional point of view from a social point of view so everywhere it's a rapid change and it's there to stay uh just to give an example a few years back we when we say software development okay there is a very structured process there is a life cycle even today in our subjects i'm sure people are studying sdlc okay and there is a uh, uh, we, we have to create uh, what is a requirement and then we need to do a development testing and then you deploy in the live area okay this is the formal process uh, or a standard operating procedure we can say but that has been disrupted phenomenally the reason being uh, a few of our uh, elite panel members they uh, rightly pointed out the consumer mindset is changing everything is driven from a consumer point of view okay uh, earlier it used to be on a transaction based i go i buy a product yeah that product is serving the common purpose i am okay with it but now if the product is not giving me the value what i am looking out for i am not ready to buy it and i want an instant personalization for whatever i buy okay so because of that the customers the companies who is giving those products or services to the customers end users they have to change and because they have to change the adoption of technology come into the fore and much more faster than what it was before so when it comes to adoption of technology who actually develops those technology it's again human resources so what we are going to learn i'm coming back to the point of software i personally feel any technology all the elite panel members they spoke yes it's all very important and relevant at this point in time i'll repeat it's all relevant important at this point in time but if you ask me few years from down the line whether these technologies are here to stay they may or they may take a different shape or form so what is very important is the software again the human resources what exactly he or she has to have in mind or how they have to be prepared themselves in the rapid business changing business environment okay so they need to have that the way the business environment is changing they need to be prepared to adjust to the changing environment we call it as a cognitive flexibility they really really need to keep abreast with what is changing and they need to be aware of what is changing and they should be quickly able to adopt and change it's like a, a playing a one day or a t20 or a test match you lose few four four five wickets earlier but people who are coming next to it, they need to quickly adopt to the situation and see how well they can anchor the innings the same way here you need to be really students or anyone for that matter even people who joined the company already okay even we all have to be really quick enough we need to have that cognitive reflexes to adapt to the changes so that we can ensure any change which comes into the world but still we will be able to adapt and change according to that change okay that is number 1 number 2 the this is one skill it's a softer skill or a behavioral skill you can call it as but that has to be fostered in the minds of young people it's very important not only young people sorry it, in, in the minds of everyone who wants to work who wants to be an entrepreneur even the companies has to change everyone has to change so that has to be fostered number 1 that's a very important skill according to me uh, which we look for because even when they come to the uh, they get the job they come into the company the learning doesn't stop the changes doesn't stop they need to keep changing and learning accordingly okay so a uh, supplement to that or a sub point to that is continual learning people should be ready to continually learn the learnability quotient is very very important it's it's extremely important so that is number 2 third is the emotional and social intelligence at the end of the day me as a resource coming into the organization i am not going to work in silos i am not going to work alone i am going to now a person from here will be virtually working with someone usa or in europe or in uk so virtual working okay and digital workplaces are in the fore now 
So it's very important as an individual, I need to have that EI and SI, which is emotional intelligence and social intelligence. What does it mean? It means that I need to understand whom I am working with, the environment I am working with, how do I collaborate with them? How do I collaborate and ensure that we bring in that synergy and success at the end of the day? Okay. So the reason why I'm not touching upon on the technology aspects, though uh, we are a technology company, every technology that will keep on changing as of now, yes, as many of them pointed out, AI, uh, it, it can be a cloud or it can be machine learning. Everything is very important that is that stays relevant as in point that is going to stay for some more time, but it, it may take a different shopper form. But as a software, we need to be prepared. The resources should be prepared. How do I take those whatever uh, new learning which comes, how will I assimilate and how will I take it in me so that it can help me in the career prospect. So these are the three important. Number one, the cognitive flexibility to adopt to rapid changes which is happening in and around us. Number two, continual learning. Number three, emotional and social uh, intelligence. These are the three things which I personally Great. feel I think, as uh, of I think now. you have taken, uh, no, you, you, you touched upon very nicely. Now maybe the next uh, question, now I will be requesting each of you to answer uh, me in some two minutes. I will start again uh, with uh, no, Naveen itself. See, now that you, know, you have democratized, democratized the recruitment, no, anybody from Kashmir to Kanyakumari can take up a test with TCS, they can get employment uh, at TCS. Unlike the earlier days, you go to only select colleges, give priority to them. So now the opportunity is to everybody, yeah, in student point of view. So what is that you advise academia to do? See here, all our teachers, principals, chairmen, directors, they are all you know, leading thousands of students. So what is the action point to them that you, you suggest? You no, know, it is not mandatory, that you suggest. Maybe in two minutes, briefly. OK. Uh, OK, it's very important for us to be prepared for the future, we create that ecosystem uh, and that ecosystem constitutes of academicians, students, corporates and parents as well, okay? And we need to co-create this ecosystem. From a student point of view or from a company point of view, uh, it is very important for people to have that immersive learning experience or an experiential learning experience, which I would say. So what does it mean? What we study in the colleges, as uh, one gentleman uh, pointed out, that it's more about uh, theoretical. Yes, theory is very important, but in a real life scenario, in a real corporate scenario, how I am able to exhibit whatever I have learned, how I am able to apply whatever I have learned, for that they need experience. So the experience doesn't come for the pressure. So how can we give the experience when you are studying itself, to give that experiential okay. learning? Just to give an example is a, Internships, what you can do in a real Maybe life. Hackathons scenario. and all, they should participate more. Than Absolutely. Just and you have a lot of corporates nowadays con uh, conducting a contest uh, based hiring where they give the real life case studies, real corporate case studies for the students to crack, to uh, encouraging them to participate in more such scenarios. So they really feel accustomed and they, are, they don't have that fear when they come into the corporate because they already got used to such. Right. things when they are in the institution itself. So I would say experiential learning is one of the key factors uh, which both corporate, academician, students and parents, everyone should encourage. Great, thank you. Ma'am, I'll move on to Mr. Arun. What is your input to the academia? So uh, what do you expect them to go back and implement? Uh, so I think a lot of focus is uh, generally given on the technical skills and curriculum and so on. So I sincerely advise or request to spend more time on soft skills as well. So generally when we hire these new college grads or interns, right, they, they will be very like to even ask questions or talk, there will be a lot of inhibition, right. So, so recently when one of our co-founders was here, I just took them to a room and it was entire silence, right. They didn't even want to ask any questions uh, and talk, right. It is very unlike, say for an example for a graduate in a foreign university and so on, right. So, I think please have a lot more soft skill courses so that when a person comes, graduates out of a college, he is much more confident and he can really stand up, uh, talk and ask questions, right, and be more open. And uh, the other thing is, which again I found as a difference uh, given the graduates from foreign universities and some of the graduates uh, whom we hire, right, um, I think they are very strong in their curriculum and so on. 
but if you ask them more on the latest technologies have they any explored anything on the latest technologies have they contributed anything to open source and so on it is they don't they are not even aware of it right so i think it is our responsibility to make sure they also aware of what is happening around us not just tied to the academia or the curriculum so that way when they come out uh, they have they the knowledge has uh, more relevance because definitely all courses and skills which they learn a lot of them lot of languages also are not relevant when they actually graduate right but that way if little more emphasis is given on learning what is more latest and even the projects which they do if we encourage them to uh, do in those technologies or in those environments or platform it will help them to be more relevant in what is their uh, latest in the world thank you thank you mr arun so i'll move to mr dipanga dipanga your expectation or you not say expectation you are uh, advice or suggestion okay. to the academia so i'll put it as our asks from the academia uh, okay so before the, i look at the ask i think uh, there are the key stakeholders that is the you know the education apex bodies the faculty the hod deans directors the different stakeholders and students and parents i think uh, everybody needs to play a critical role in some of the ask that we look at Uh, from an academia standpoint and i will categorize my ask into two categories one is inside classroom the other is the outside classroom outside classroom i think my esteemed colleague had also already mentioned about immersive learning now immersive learning from a company like ours becomes uh, of critical importance because that is where why say learning by doing or what we call the project based learning and there are different ways by which uh, uh, students can Uh, you know get into immersive learning projects through you know student competitions through hackathons and various you know other competitions which are uh, you know which are available and you know autodesk is a part of most of the hackathons including the smart india hackathon 2020 so but one of the biggest hurdle in this is i think the academic curriculum does not give any credit for students and so students do it outside their normal academic curriculum which is a really burn on their academic uh, you know schedule so i think i have had this discussion with many stakeholders and and some of the iits have already started giving some credits but unless it is embedded in our education ecosystem by way of some credits or whatever you may call it will very it will it will kind of remain where it is today Uh, the second point is inside classroom is where i am talking about how do we mandate use of technologies into existing courses and that is where i say complementing existing design course using digital tools okay this should be fairly simple provided faculties are willing to learn and change okay this there is no disrespect to any faculty who is here but i think any new thing that you embed in the curriculum would need more work and you know more you know uh, you know you, you need to change you need to adapt the way you are integrating technologies so my two ask immersive learning and integrating into the uh, into curriculum. the core curriculum thanks right. so you are saying no instead of making it uh, optional somehow try and make it into curriculum so that no people will be yeah. definitely doing it yeah and there okay. should be compelling reason and that is okay. how i would say change will become you know if you really want to make a radical sure. change sure thank you mr rajan your perspectives uh, because see you, you you were the hr man and now businessman so you should give us uh, some insights on what academy should do sure i will uh, kind of uh, continue from the points i made earlier i talked about how every individual has this aspiration for very personalized product services and offerings and at the same time they want to belong to a community right these are kind of opposing forces but uh, they drive a lot of what goes on in the world right uh, my two expectations or asks are asks are the following one is that we teach our students how to understand reductionism meaning that you are able to get down into the details analysis right go down into the into the parts that make up a whole and then be able to dissect it and and really come to terms with what are all the nitty gritties of any problem that you are trying to solve uh, a reductionist approach uh, approach takes a very analysis perspective and teaching uh, students 
uh, students of any age, for that matter, I'm not just talking about uh, college students, uh, uh, how to do analysis and how to pursue the reductionist approach, I think it's a very important skill. The opposing force is, uh, is holism, right? How do you learn synthesis? How do you put together things? And how do you make sure that you're able to see the bigger picture? Now, what I'm kind of talking about, uh, uh, in, in some sense, uh, uh, the, the, the ingredients of how those things can be made possible in an academic curriculum have already been touched upon. And we can talk, in, we can talk about internships, immersive learning, hackathons, uh, uh, in terms of uh, making certain aspects of uh, social and emotional intelligence acquisition of those intelligences part of the curriculum, for example, right, as Deepanka talked about. All of those are possibilities. But at the end of the day, when students finish their program, they should be well versed at both ends of the spectrum. They should know how to be excellent analysts. They should also know how to be excellent synthesizers, how, how they are able to put together things and see the big picture. So that will be my expectation. Thank you. I'll, I'll move to Mr. Saurabh. Some great suggestions here uh, from the panel. A lot of people really rightly said, of course, it has to be very uh, collaborative, immersive learning and everything, of course, makes sense. But I think we also need to understand that we are slaves of our memory. So also in all the students also, it's true for students as well, the students will only be able to achieve what they are being exposed to. So if we really want our students to really, you know, think beyond the existing thought process, I think one thing that can be done is when you have your curriculum being implemented in the classroom, you should invite somebody specifically from that domain who has actually been implementing it. For instance, if you are an electrical engineering professor and you are teaching them power engineering, get somebody from Tamil Nadu Electricity Board, or maybe an engineer or somebody, and let him talk about what exactly you have been teaching them. If you are teaching them something, let's say you are talking about, let's say, uh, enterprise solutions, get somebody from VMware, get somebody from Oracle, get somebody from Autodesk, get those people in the classrooms. And if you can really do that every day, that's one of the best things that you can actually do. Because it's only exposure that will change the entire thought process and the entire path will change. I'll give you an example. A lot of universities around the globe, when they actually uh, follow this case study based learning, a lot of times it happens that, you know, whatever, let's say a case study is about XYZ company. I'll give you an example. In, at Harvard, once they were actually talking about a case study, how Apple changed a lot of things. And they actually got Steve Jobs in the classroom. So I think that was a great validation. And that's, that's what we should keep doing. I think exposure is the key. And that ways we can definitely change everything. Uh, the entire perspective will change. And of course, we'll help them accelerate with the growth. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. So let, let me hear from Bharat. Um, I'm going to request a little both in two minutes. OK, three minutes. <laughs> OK, make it four. <laughs> So uh, let me just set this context back. Um, um, there, are, there are three uh, sides of a triangle for the success of any student in real life back when they, when they leave college or the institution they represent with you. One side of it is attitude. A lot of us spoke here about attitude, you know, the, the soft skills about themselves, the, the interpersonal relationship skills and, and various areas. Another is knowledge. And the third is the skills of the domain that they represent. Skill, knowledge, and attitude are the three pertinent areas. And the focus of this conversation that we're all having here largely is in the skill development area. Knowledge is something that academia has fantastically done in India historically over a period of time. We are the knowledge capital of the world, right? Um, but the challenge in real life has been um, you know, some of this knowledge, when it translates to industries that we represent, uh, we have to conduct a lot more internal training because the skill that is required to translate this knowledge is a gap. And that's the purpose of this, uh, you know, talk. Attitude is something that we all have to contribute back, right? Parents, the society in which the child lives, the institution, the students, and the academic, uh, academic responsible people, right from the management to the teachers, we all contribute back to the building of the attitude of the child. So we have a responsibility everywhere. But as a technology leader from Oracle, uh, as, as Oracle, uh, there's something that I would like to share, not just to tell what is my expectation from you as teachers, but what responsibility we as an industry have to collaborate with you 
so that you are able to deliver that effectively, that skill development area effectively. So mine is not going to be an ask from them, but to tell you what we at Oracle are doing to help you deliver that to your students. Oracle about is, is, a, is a 40 year old organization, right? Uh, four decades, uh, about two and a half decades ago, as a philanthropic initiative, Oracle has started Oracle Academic. Now what does Oracle Academic do? is enable you to develop that skill that we are today talking about to augment uh, on, on the future technologies that we have to offer. And you'll be pleasantly surprised, Oracle Academia is completely free since it's a, uh, you know, it's a philanthropic initiative. <coughs> thousands and thousands of institutions worldwide and millions of students have benefited out of it. More pertinently in India, I'll have to give you the exact numbers, the 1,700 institutions have embraced Oracle Academia. And in that, thousands of teachers have been enabled. We have six partners, Pan-India, and lakhs and lakhs of students have benefited. I'll just share a few perspectives on that. We have course content available with curriculum, with mediums for classroom content, as well as free online labs for both the students and for the teachers. And we don't charge a penny for this. All you need to do is register at academy.oracle.com. So your teachers, who today the faculty who need to you know, enhance your skills, we have a separate course content for them. And similarly, we have labs for them. So that they also have a practical experience. We spoke about immersive learning. Oracle's online labs that are free for you have immersive learning experiences for the teachers so that you can then build it for your students too. On top of it, we have Ask an Expert. So if you have roadblocks, we have experts to support you. We do free boot camps on big data, analytics, artificial intelligence. We have our business applications, which is Oracle ERP, which is the number one ERP worldwide, right? We have our ERP application there. We have a CRM application there. We have a marketing stack there. We have our HRMS applications there. So business applications are given to you and your students free. Database space is given in this free. And here's the sweet spot. Oracle gives every student within your institution. If an institution signs up for Oracle Academy, we train your teachers and we also give free cloud space for each of your students. $300 worth of Oracle cloud space is given free. Now what does that mean per student $300? Let us say a professor wants to create a skill wherein a particular application is being built by the students, embracing 10 students in a project. All 10 students, $3,000 worth of cloud space is given free. So you can go build that application, and more importantly, come back to industries like that and tell us this application is available free, so you please go test it and give us feedback. You can also monetize it with there are certain terms and conditions. So the skill area is not just about developing that in an immersive environment, but also going to businesses and telling them, use a product, give us feedback, we'll find on the product. So what exactly does this do to you? Your student not just develops knowledge, he develops skill, he also gets a business acumen to come to real life because areas of negotiation, areas of collaboration, everything gets immersed in this process. And I would encourage all of you to, to leverage what we've given to you uh, in, our, in our social contribution to, to, to build this yeah, and definitely. This. See if you know, I'm sure uh, no, your team member is here. So almost all of the colleges here are Oracle Academy members. So anybody who's an ICT Academy member by default, we will move them to become an Oracle Academy member. So we have facilitated more than uh, 4,000 teacher training in Oracle technology since our inception, and you have been a strongest partner for us. And this this is something new. What he talks about getting $300 cloud credit, like what we had with our AWS uh, uh, partnership where they gave us. Uh, you know, $150 cloud credit for every student where they were able to use the AWS infrastructure for their uh, learning. The similar one is now launched by Oracle Academy. By default, you know, if you have uh, already signed with Oracle Academy, our, our team will ensure this particular uh, benefit is passed on to you. I think we, we had multiple perspectives from different uh, uh, companies and different experts and uh, and we touched upon everything, right? From technology, attitude, no soft skill. Because even before the panel started, we said, no, we should not touch upon soft skill because every other panel will speak about soft skill, communication skill, but you know, which, which couldn't be avoided, right? Because end of the day, when we talk about technology, when we talk about human resources, 
tall no soft skill come in the front and communication in no somehow it comes no so thank you very much no since we have already late for half an hour now we are not going for audience q and a i got a message because we have delayed so but we will ensure no our audience are there during the tea break we will uh, no take q and a but no i mean individually they will connect with you uh, we'll, shall we have a big round of applause to all the panelists who delivered their uh, the perspectives